Gothic 1 is a role-playing game developed by the German-based Piranha Bytes, released in 2001. Over the years, it's become a cult classic among RPG fans, especially in Eastern Europe. The game was quite ahead of its time and served as a massive point of inspiration for the Witcher series by CD Projekt Red. Since the Witcher games are some of my favorite RPGs of all time, I was curious to see if I could still get something worthwhile out of this 23 year old game. And after 25 hours of gameplay, I bring you my 2024 review of Gothic from a first time player's perspective. Since the game is from 2001, we need to download some fan-made patches to get the game to run on modern hardware. This used to be quite a bit of a hassle, but in 2022 the game received Steam Workshop support and now it only takes a couple of clicks to get the game running. I tried to stay as close to the vanilla game as possible to get the authentic experience. The only additional mod I downloaded was a DirectX 11 upgrade, which enhances performance and the graphics. And with that out of the way, let's delve into the backstory of Gothic. The Kingdom of Myrtana is at war with the Orcs. King Robar II requires magical ore from the mines of the Isle of Coronis to forge weapons for his troops. Regardless of the severity of their crimes, criminals are forced to mine this ore. To ensure the prisoners cannot escape, the king enlisted the most powerful mages of the empire, six from the Circle of Fire and six from the Circle of Water, to create a magical barrier around the mine. But something disturbed the ritual, and the barrier grew way larger than expected, trapping the mages inside. In the chaos, the prisoners mount an uprising, overpowering and killing all the guards. Coronis falls under the control of the convicts, and while humans can enter the barrier, they are unable to leave. With no alternative, the king is forced to negotiate with the convicts, as he still requires the ore for his war efforts. He strikes a deal with the prisoners. They continue to provide him with ore, and in return, he promises to send supplies from the outside world, including materials, food, alcohol and even women. You play as the nameless hero, and you're sentenced to the Valley of Mines. We don't know if you committed a crime or not, but to the king, everybody's fair game. Before being thrown through the barrier, you receive a letter from a fire mage, tasking you with delivering it to the High Magician of Fire, who is located in the old camp, one of the three factions in the game. After that, down into the water we go. Welcome to the colony. <laughs> These cutscenes are a little bit funnier than I expected. I think it adds to the charm of the game, to be honest. Get up. This is where we meet Diego, and when I listened to his voice, it sounded very familiar to me. I'm Diego. I'm... I'm not interested in who you are. You've just arrived. It reminded me of a certain character from the Witcher series. After a quick Google search, my suspicion was confirmed. Diego is voiced by William Roberts, who also voiced Vesemir in the Witcher games. I look after the new arrivals. That's all for now. Hmm. You might find it hard to believe, but I was young too once. Well, younger. Diego, much like Vesemir did for Geralt, plays a mentor-like role. After providing us with some pointers, the open world is ours to explore. If you can get used to the controls that is. You see, the game has a very unusual control scheme. It features a dedicated action key that doesn't do anything on its own. Instead, you have to press a second key simultaneously to perform the desired action. For example, to open a chest, you have to walk up to the chest, hold the action key and press forward to open it. The same goes for opening doors, talking to NPCs, trading, etc. This took a while to adjust to, but after some time it became quite intuitive. The same wasn't true for the combat system for me. It almost made me quit the game entirely. For combat, you have to unsheath your weapon using the spacebar or whatever key you've bound for it. To swing your weapon, you have to hold the action key and press W, A, S or D to swing in that direction, which locks you into place while doing so. I was so used to modern combat systems where you can freely move between swings that I kept trying to play the game that way. Additionally, strafing from left to right has a unique key as well. I bound them to Q and E. However, if you use these too much, you'll lose track of your enemy and become vulnerable to attacks, resulting in me dying a lot. Although it took me way longer to get used to the combat system, eventually it also clicked and I started having a lot more fun. Okay, let's return to where we left off. After exploring for a bit, the first landmark we see is the old camp in the center of the map. As I made my way toward it, I got pranked by one of the guards stationed at the bridge. Is that the old camp over there? No, that's the new camp. The old camp is underneath the bridge. It sets the tone nicely for the way people treat newcomers in the colony. This became especially clear when I refused to pay one of the guards for protection. 
You mean you want me to pay protection money? No thanks. I can take care of myself. Have it your own way, kid. You'll soon regret turning down a friendly offer. Not long after, I get approached by a character named Grim, who asks me to retrieve an amulet. Turns out it was a trap. He lured me out of the camp only to mug me. So, here we are. Far away from your friend Diego. I'm to send you regards from Bloodvin. Try that. Yeah, you really start this game as an absolute nobody. Shit, he hasn't even got any ore on him. It's a nice change of pace from the usual chosen one trope we see in a lot of our media. To get a little stronger, I thought it would be a good idea to challenge someone in the arena. How hard could a one-on-one -on -one fight be? Pain is a question of willpower. Next time I'll kill you. Okay, I guess I've gotta be the errand boy for the first couple of hours. There are multiple NPCs in the old camp that will give you quests that involve very little fighting. Completing these quests will reward you with experience and some ore, which is this game's currency. What I absolutely love about this game is the sense of progression you feel, both in your character's stats and skills, as well as in exploration. Let's start with the stats and skills. There are two ways to earn experience. One is by completing quests, and the other is by killing enemies. When you level up, you get 10 skill points. Fairly straightforward so far, right? What's cool about Gothic is that you can't just spend these points whenever, like in most RPGs. In Gothic, you need to find someone who's willing to train you. It's a really elegant solution to an otherwise very gamey system. There are three base stats you can spend these points on. Strength, Dexterity and Mana. Strength increases your damage with melee weapons. Dexterity enhances your proficiency with ranged weapons. And Mana allows you to cast more powerful spells. In addition to that, there are also more specific combat skills you can train, such as one-handed, two-handed, bows, crossbows and different tiers of magic. And yet again, Piranha Bites do something I haven't seen before. When you start using a one-handed weapon, your character doesn't know what to do with it. He will hold the weapon in both hands very clumsily. But after training your one-handed skill, your character will learn the right technique and will actually hold the weapon correctly. If you train the skill once more, you'll become a master, which allows you to perform combos that are very effective at stunlocking an enemy. The jump in proficiency is again visualized in the animations. Such a cool touch. The final couple of skills are sneaking, pickpocket, acrobatics and animal trophies. I haven't done much sneaking or pickpocketing, so I can't really comment on that. I did make sure to get all the hunting skills early on, so I could sell the animal trophies for ore, which I desperately needed. A little later, I also put some points into acrobatics, which allowed me to jump further. This came in clutch when one of the quests required me to get hold of a certain artifact that was out of reach. The game tells you to use the telekinesis spell, but I didn't have enough mana for it. A bit of an oversight if you ask me. You aren't supposed to jump that gap, but by using all my Call of Duty 2 strafe jumping knowledge and the help of the acrobatic skill, I was able to make the jump anyways. I mainly used bows as a backup weapon, or to snipe higher level enemies from a distance. However, as the game progressed, I found myself relying on them less and less. Magic, on the other hand, is hard to come by in the early game, so I primarily focused on a melee build. Yet, in the late game, there are plenty of cool spells to try out. For example, I transformed into a meat bug to pass under this closed gate. Really cool stuff. The final part of character progression is armor. It is very hard to find early on, and is absolutely necessary to take on anything stronger than a scavenger or a mole rat. Once you get a good set of armor, your character instantly feels more powerful. The primary method of acquiring armor is by joining one of the three factions. Let me tell you what they're all about. The first faction you encounter is the Old Camp, which is the wealthiest among the three. This is because of their trade deal with the King and their control over the Old Mine, the primary source of ore in the colony. The camp is structured with an outer ring and a central castle. The Old Camp maintains a strict hierarchy. At the bottom are the diggers, who form the bulk of the workforce and live in wooden shacks in the outer ring. Above them are the shadows. They consist of more notable figures, such as traders, scouts, thieves and assassins, also residing in the outer ring. Next up are the guards, the backbone of the camp's main army. Clad in armor, taken from the royal guards killed during the revolt, they now live within the castle walls. Highly trained and formidable, they often exploit and abuse lower ranking camp members. After that, we have the fire mages, who also reside within the castle walls. They advise the camp's leader and provide magical abilities. And finally, we have the ore barons, the highest ranking group within the old camp, led by a man named Gomez. They were the instigators of the revolt and the ones who established the trade deal with the king. 
The second faction, known as the New Camp, formed when a group of people broke away from the Old Camp due to their discontent with Gomez's leadership. They left to establish their own community, settling in the far west of the colony. Later, they stumbled upon another ore mine, located a bit to the south. Among the members of the new camp were a couple of water mages who discovered a method to destroy the barrier. They believed that a substantial source of magical power could shatter it. Following this discovery, the group has been accumulating all the ore extracted from the free mine, aiming to use it to destroy the barrier in the future. Such a big amount of ore attracted a lot of thieves and bandits to the camp, so the water magicians made a deal with a man named Lee and his mercenaries to keep the peace. Unlike the old camp, the new camp lacks a strict hierarchy, yet exploitation still persists. The rogues put newcomers to work in the rice fields, located in front of the camp, to ensure a steady food supply. Then there are the diggers. They're treated a lot more fairly here in comparison to the old camp. The rogues, mercenaries and water mages leave each other alone for the most part. The third and final faction is the sect camp, led by Iberion. He received a vision from an entity known as the Sleeper, which led him to an old temple located in the swamp. Here, he and his followers pray to their newfound deity for liberation. To commune with the Sleeper, they cultivate and use a drug called Swamp Weed. Additionally, they rely on selling this drug to the other two camps as their primary source of income. Yeah, this faction is literally getting stoned all day in the swamp. Their ranks consist of novices, the lowest class within the camp, who primarily handle the camp's workload while also praying to the sleeper and training to ascend to the ranks of Templars or Gurus. Templars, the camp's elite warriors, are tasked with guarding the camp and the old mine. There, they provide swamp weed and protection to the diggers and guards in exchange for the minecrawler's glands needed for certain potions. And finally, there are the Gurus, who serve as the spiritual and magical masters of the camp possessing the ability to communicate most easily with their god. Overall, I really like the way the different factions are executed. They all feel unique and believable. Personally, I joined the old camp in my playthrough. However, it's disappointing that after chapter 1, there are barely any faction-specific quests, so in the long run, your choice doesn't really matter. Alright, let's revisit my point about progression. My first point was about the stats and skills, and the second crucial aspect is the world and exploration. From the moment you start the game, the open world is fully explorable. However, strategically placed enemies populate the map, blocking most of the routes. These enemies have a static power level and do not respawn when killed. You can probably see where I'm going with this. At first, there's only a limited amount of exploration possible, because basically everything kills you in one hit. But after you level up a bit and acquire some armor, those wolves that once blocked your path are now easy to defeat. Slowly but surely, you can extend the range of exploration in this very organic way. This type of design also prevents overleveling, as it's impossible to farm mobs for experience. You might think the world will feel lifeless after a while, but the developers thought of a solution. Every new chapter will introduce new enemies to the map. These enemies spawn at logical locations. For instance, wolves spawn in the forest and mole rats spawn in caves. Remembering areas where you've encountered mobs will come in handy in later quests as well. For example, in one quest where I needed to kill a shadow beast, I recalled its habitat from a previous session and knew exactly where to go. That felt super rewarding because it was knowledge I naturally acquired through gameplay rather than through a quest marker. One quality of life feature I really enjoyed was the absence of an equip load mechanic. In most games I find it to be a nuisance that doesn't add anything to the gameplay. I also really like the barrier as an in-universe boundary for the player space. When you have a barrier that can be explained by the story, there's no need for invisible walls or massive mountains. The final comment I want to make about the exploration aspect of the game is the awesome use of verticality and hidden areas. The game is filled with climbable ledges, caves and hidden rooms, which are just a cherry on top of an already super rewarding part of the game. Next up is my absolute favorite part of the whole experience, its atmosphere and immersion. I want to start off by mentioning the awesome soundtrack by Kaya Rosenkrantz. You've been listening to it throughout this entire review, and I must say the track you're currently hearing is my absolute favorite among all the songs. The tracks in general strike a perfect balance between atmospheric and epic. Excellent stuff. Then there's the weather system. It's really quite basic, but it adds a ton of ambience to the game. I've seen fog, rain and even some lightning on occasion. What I love about this game is that the world doesn't revolve around you. Animals will hunt and sleep depending on the time of day, whether you're there or not. 
The same applies to NPCs. They go to bed, have some breakfast, wash themselves, go to work and much more. It really makes you feel like you are part of an ecosystem. As a player, you also take part in many of these activities, which truly immerses you into the world. This feeling is enhanced by the fact that there are barely any HUD elements on screen at all times. At most, you'll only see an NPC's name and health bar, along with your own health bar. That's it. This minimalism extends to the map and the absence of quest markers. The map you carry is very basic, leaving you to fill in the gaps yourself. Similarly, quests are presented with only a short description in your journal, without giant exclamation marks telling you where to go. It's actually really refreshing in this day and age. Oh, and one more thing I want to mention before moving on is how NPCs react to your behavior. If you draw your sword, they become anxious, and if you knock somebody out, they will try and avoid further conflict in the future. Details like that are just perfect. So far, I've been really positive about this game, but Gothic was a cult classic for a reason. To appreciate everything I've spent the last 16 minutes talking about, you'll have to put up with a lot of bugs, jank and questionable design. There will be NPCs randomly standing on tables, NPCs getting stuck and lots of backtracking. While nothing game breaking, it can be quite annoying. Sometimes the game can even be unintentionally funny. For example, the voice acting, it's all over the place. Some of the voice talent does a great job, while others are so bad it's hilarious. I'm searching for the focus. Unfortunately, you're too late for that. I've already found it. And I'm keeping it for myself. The sleeper talked to me last night and made me his only tool. Now I'll only serve the sleeper. No more Templars or gurus. Only me alone. Die! One minor annoyance for me was how loud the harpy enemies are. Everything's fine, and then suddenly your ears start bleeding. There are two more things I want to mention before I move on to my verdict of the game. Firstly, the inventory system is just really clunky. In the late game, you'll be sifting through heaps of items to find what you need. Combined with the unusual control scheme, it's quite a mess. And finally, I think the story isn't as strong as the game's setting and factions. The early game is amazing, but once you get about halfway into the game, the story becomes very linear and quite bland. It boils down to a lot of backtracking and fetch quests, with the occasional dungeon. It's not bad by any means, but it does bog down the experience. And that brings me to the main question of this video. Does Gothic hold up in 2024? For me, it's a resounding yes. It was fantastic to check out a game from 2001 and see where CDPR took their inspiration from. It's remarkable how this small team of German developers managed to innovate so much in a single game. While the game isn't perfect by any means, beneath a hefty amount of jank lies a title that was ambitious and daring, and that's always worth celebrating in my book. I can understand why this game is beloved by such a hardcore fanbase, and it's wonderful to see it still being supported to this day. I'm now officially a fan of Gothic, and my fingers are crossed with you all for the upcoming remake. And that wraps up the video. I hope you enjoyed this one. What did you think of this slightly different format? Let me know in the comments down below. Liking the video and subscribing to my channel would tremendously support me and ensure you don't miss any future uploads. Alright, that's it from me. I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.